and promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Thus, we respectfully ask that AA speakers and AA members not be photographed, videotaped, or identified by full name on audio tapes or in published or broadcast reports or meetings, including those on the internet. The assurance of anonymity is essential in our effort to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share our recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA principles come before personalities. A further note about anonymity. Out of respect for others, please do not take photographs during any of the meetings at the Florida State Convention or the Southeastern Conference. Also, be considerate when taking photographs around convention venues. Take care that you do not capture images of AA members, family members, and friends who do not get permission and may not wish to appear in your pictures. Please do not post recognizable photos of identifiable AA members on websites accessible to the public, including unrestricted pages on social networking sites. I'd like to introduce Monica, who will read the preamble. Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica, and I am an alcoholic. My home group is the Coral Gables Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, my sobriety date is August the 14th, 1996. And Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And now I'd like to introduce Corey, who will read the 12th step. Hi, my name is Corey, and my home group is the 12 and 12 in Hallandale, Florida. These are the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Number one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Number three, we made a decision to turn our will over to the lives of the care of God as we understood Him. Number four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Number six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Number seven, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Number eight, we made a list of all the persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to all of them. Number nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would hurt them or injure them. Continued to take personal inventory when we were wrong and promptly admitted it. Number 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for His knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And number 12, having had a spiritual waking as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to all alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. This is the long form of the 12th tradition. And finally, we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the principle of anonymity has an immense spiritual significance. It reminds us that we are not to place that we are to place principles before personalities, that we are actually to practice a genuine humility. This to the end that our great blessings may never spoil us, that we shall forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Bob Dean. Can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. 
My name is Bob Darrell and I'm alcoholic. And only through the grace of a God that I was afraid to believe in that I've accessed through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, good sponsorship, and a persistent and consistent commitment to the primary purpose of helping other alcoholics. I have not had a drink or any mind or emotion altering substance since October 31st, 1978. And for that, I owe you my life and probably as important, if not more, my freedom. Abstinence from alcohol without freedom for a guy like me drives me. It's so insane that guys like me commit suicide sober. So I'm not only sober, but I'm free. And we'll talk, maybe we'll get to what I'm free of later. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank the members of the committee um, for the privilege of coming down here. I, this is a weekend where I'm, sp I'm spending a weekend with a lot of old friends. Uh, the, I, the speakers here are amazing. You have some great speakers here. Uh, Steve, uh, Wayne was, Wayne is always, uh, makes me laugh. And uh, Bob, I've known Bob, he was a member, he lived in Vegas, a member of my home group for a while, and gave a great talk. And Steve was, a, uh, Steve was, I've heard, I, I heard the spirit of Scott R. in, in Steve's talk uh, today. It was really, it was, it was very, it was very cool for me. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, it's been a great, and Ralph's uh, fourth step, Ralph's very good with that. It's been a great convention right up to now. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> why? I, I just had a funny experience sitting up there. I was, I was doing a little meditation I always try to do before I have to do, do this. Uh, and I was, as, as I'm doing it, I hear this, this, the voice of the convention, he keeps repeating over and over again, the green awning is your friend. The green, and, and he's over and over, and I hear that, I thought, that voice, you know that voice. And it, all of a sudden I went back like four decades to when I was a kid and ran away from home to go to a rock concert, hearing the same voice go, do not take the orange acid, do not take the orange acid. And it was like, looking at him like, it's the guy. <laughs> it was the weirdest experience. <laughs> I have a disease called alcoholism. Uh, it almost killed me, and oddly enough, I almost died from something I didn't even understand or know that I had. Uh, all I could ever see was the symptoms of the disease, the arrests, and the drinking myself sick from, from this, but I could never see what was really killing me. And I couldn't see it until I was, even get a glimpse of it until I was sober for a long time. Um, I, I believe, and I, there's no way to prove this, I believe that I may have had alcoholism before I ever found alcohol. Like I was some kind of freeze-dried alcoholic waiting for it. And, and I believe that because of what I know of this disease of self-centeredness, this malady of my being, is that I wasn't right before I ever picked up a drink. Now, I don't know why I wasn't right, because I, it's, I, was, I listened to AA speakers who come from alcoholic homes where they're just really abused and had terrible, horrific childhoods, and they came out of that with all the same feelings that I had in a family that loved me, and would have done anything and never abused me. I mean, they were just wonderful parents. But there was something about me that just was so internally focused, even as a child, that I looked out at a world that seemed very distant from me. Uh, and I, I remember as a, in grade school having these feelings of, of not fitting, and I couldn't have put them into words. But I, there was just an awkwardness about me around people that other people didn't seem to have. And it seemed to me like everybody just kind of had something I didn't have. Like, a, like maybe I was born without the social merging genes that they are something. I, they got a pill for that now, I heard. Uh, just, uh, they, 
got a pill for everything. Uh, but I didn't feel like I fit, even as a, as a young kid. And I, there was no, I couldn't put my finger on why. So I became what it talks about in the big book and into action before I ever picked up a drink, I started living the double life. I, I started becoming the pretend guy, the guy who pretended he was okay. The guy who pretended he was cool. The guy who pretended he wasn't afraid. The guy who pretended he was tough. The guy who pretended he was a part of. And those of us that have done that, you develop a, a squirmy anxiousness about being found out. And I was, I, I just felt like I was coming from behind all the time. And, and when I started hanging around with a gang of kind of wild kids, it, I wanted to fit with them so desperately that I would have done anything to, to be a part of. And no matter what I do, I'm always coming from behind. I can't act tough enough. I can't shoplift enough. I can't cuss enough. I can't do anything enough to get me to a point where I start to feel like they look. I'm always, something's missing in me, and it's driving me, and yet I don't know it. I don't know what's driving me, but I, I was a driven little kid. And one day we pulled a burglary in the, in the neighborhood, and, and we broke into this house, and some people were gone, and one of the things we stole was some bottles of whiskey, and, and uh, I didn't know nothing about it. I, I had never seen my parents drunk. Looking back, I don't even think I understood that it got you high. I don't even think I knew that. Um, but I'm with these kids. I'm about, I'm almost 12 years old, not quite old, coming up on 13. And I just want to belong. I just want to feel like they look. And we started to pass that bottle. Of, I remember the label to this day it was a quart bottle of Seagram 7 around. And I'm watching. When you're, when you're a pretend kind of person, you've got to watch people and then try to emulate what they do in order to fit. And what I see happening is they pass this bottle around. The guys, a couple of guys that took a real big hit off that got a lot of attention from the other guys. So by the time it gets to me, I'm in. I'm going to take a big hit. I'm just glad it wasn't cat urine because I'm in. And, and it gets to me and I take this big hit. And it, oh my God, and they never told me that it just feels like it's burning your insides out. And somehow, I think I was so afraid of what they'd think if I didn't. I threw it up. I, somehow I kept it down, and when the burden stopped, something started to happen to me. And it would really, I can tell you a lot of things that happened that day, uh, some of them good, some of them bad, but the thing that happened is a hook was set in me. And a hook was set in me because for the first time in my life, I was with these guys that I never felt like I was good enough for, or tough enough for, or cool enough for. And all of a sudden, that just seemed to fall away from me. And I really started, I really felt a connection with these guys. I really felt like I was a part of. It was like I don't have to pretend anymore. I could actually come out and play. There was a tremendous sense of freedom in it. Um, and then I, I got in trouble, and, and it was a bad deal. But unbeknownst to me, getting lit up from that moment on just seemed to move into the center of my life. And over the next many years, if you would have asked me what was important to you, I would have told you a lot of different things. I, I might have told you school, I might have told you my family, I might have told you my girlfriend, I might have told you the band I was in, I might have told you uh, spo the sport I was playing, I might have told you all kinds of stuff. But if you'd have watched me, you would have seen that the only time I seem to look like I'm okay is when I'm about half lit up. And it seems like I just live for it. And just exist between opportunities to get lit up. And by the time um, I'm almost 16 years old, I've been in a lot of trouble. And I'm, my God, I'm not even six, quite 16 yet. And I find myself standing before a juvenile court judge for the third time, saying judge, and this is bad. And I, I'm there, uh, and I don't know why I'm there. If you'd asked me why I was there, I would have told you a bunch of crap. I'd have told you about snitches and about a society that wants to curtail real freedom, real human freedom, because they can drink at my age in Europe, for God's sakes. You know, I'd have told you all kinds of stuff like that. But the real reason I'm there, there's something wrong with me. And I don't know what it is, but every time I go out to party with my friends, I have this inability to shut her down when you should. 
I always go a little bit too far. I don't just, I can't just get drunk. Some of my friends get drunk. I can't just get drunk. I gotta get drunk drunk. When I'm drunk drunk, there's some stuff seems like a good idea, not a good idea. <laughs> and I just, you know, and I don't know how that, I don't know that I've got alcoholism. I don't know that I have the single definitive characteristic of alcoholism. And that is an allergic reaction to alcohol. That, as our book says, manifests itself in a phenomenon of craving. That every drink I have ever taken in my whole life, from my first drink and the effect when I felt that, to the last drink, has always made me feel like I'd, I'd like to have another drink. In, in every drink of alcohol I have ever taken lights something up inside me that just yearns for more of that feeling. And I have always had that. I have never, I have never taken a non-alcoholic drink or a social drink in my life that ever did anything other than that phenomenon of craving for me. But I couldn't see it, and I, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And but I'm in trouble. And my mother and father are in that courtroom because my mother and father loved me, and my mother and father would have done anything to help me. I, I am sad to tell you that years later I broke their heart over and over and over and over again to the point where they would have nothing to do with me eventually. But at that time they'd have done anything for me. They would have mortgaged their house. Like they, they would say did later to, to, to protect me because they, they, they needed money for stuff. They, my mother went to work later because of my fines and stuff. And they'd have done anything. And uh, they, the, the courts were, they were talking about juvenile Probation was talking about sending me away to a place with a horrific reputation for abuse for kids. And my mother and father were in that courtroom trying to make a deal with the judge. And instead of going to the pet place with, with a bad reputation, I had to go somewhere else and live for a while. And I, I, I go to this new place, and I, I'm the new kid on the block. And I've been sober for a while now. And, and I'm pretty good at staying sober when I'm licking my wounds. And I've been sober, but I'm a little overdue to get lit up. I mean, it's, I've been doing time here for a while, and, and I'm at this new place, and, and I don't fit with any of these guys. So what do you do if you're like me, and you're always coming from behind? You have to target the cool kids. You have to target the guys that look like they have the juice, the guys that look like they have it going on. And I targeted some of these kids, and I, I wanted to fit with them. They looked like they had it happening. When you're secretly nothing, you got to look for the people that look like there's something and hope if you rub, you hang out with them, some of their something's going to rub out on some of my nothing, right? And, and I'm talking to one of these guys who's one of the leaders in this group of guys, and I'm telling him my story, and I'm telling him about the trouble I'm in and the gang of guys I run around with. And, and you know how we are. We don't just, we're not legitimate. I have to enhance it a little bit, make myself look a little cooler. So he's getting the... the version the, of the Super Bob on steroids version of Bob, kind of, and, and uh, he's listening to me, and then he says something to me, it was music to my ears, he says, oh, so you like to party, do you? I said, yes, I do. I, I thought maybe he'd pull out a pint or something, you know, I was, yes. And instead he starts bad rapping my drinking, he starts saying to me, he says, well, you drink that alcohol, can't control that, that stuff make you crazy. Now, he's backing me right up because I loved alcohol. I, at that time in my life, I drank, my, my drink of choice was 151 rum. That gets you there right away. I mean, there's no social drinking of 151 rum, let me tell you. There's no social drinking of Everclear either. You drink that stuff for one reason, one reason only, to get downtown now, and I love that. And he's bad rapping it, and he's backing me off. And then he says something to me, that I, I didn't understand what he was talking about at first. He says, what if I told you I could give you something to make you feel as good as that rum? Only they won't smell it on your breath, you won't slur, slur your words, you won't stagger. Nobody will even know you're high, you keep a whole week's supply in your shirt pocket. What would you say to that? I don't know what he's talking about, but it's like, sign me up. And he introduced me to drugs, and I gotta tell you something, I'm a real alcoholic. Alcoholics should not do drugs, it's bad. <laughs> Oh my God! It, it, I do drugs alcoholically. I, I, I do them like a crazy person. I, I, I was talking to Steve 
talking about doing amphetamines. Why get into amphetamines? But in, in no time at all, I'm the guy that if you left me alone in your car and you went in to get cigarettes, by the time you come back, I'm, I'm trying to take apart your dashboard looking for microphones from the police, you know, because, because I'm nuts. I, 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 I remember went to New York City one time to, to cop some stuff. And, and I was absolutely convinced that every, do you know how many taxi cabs are in Manhattan? I thought every single taxi cab was a cop. I mean, that'll make, you, that'll make your head blow up. I mean, was, and a guy, I'm so whacked from that stuff. A guy came along and said, try some of this. And I don't even know what it is. When, when the throwing up stopped, the spinning of my head just went, and I could think straight, he introduced me to heroin, but I'm a real alcoholic. Alcoholics should not do drugs. I just took, slammed it, me with it against the wall. And, and I did that for a number of years and came full circle back to alcohol. And I, I, don't, I don't know uh, for sure, but I've always suspected that, that my little several years soaring into that uh, was for the same reason that Dr. Bob possibly did high-powered sedatives. Barbitschwitz every day of his life for 17 years because it bought him extended periods of abstinence. But Bob's reaction to alcohol was exactly like mine. Every time I picked up a drink, that same thing happened to me, is I couldn't stop. I, I remember I was, uh, I was trying to be in this band. Uh, this is one of the amends I've never made, too, because I, I, I don't know how to find this woman. But I, I was in a band, and the band leader was this very nice lady, and she, she was the, the lead singer and keyboard player, and she owned all the equipment. And so I'd just show up with my guitar, and we would play these bars where if you were in the band, you got to drink for free. Well, you can't do that to me. I mean, because I'm the guy taking a nap in the booth by the end before the evening's over. So her whole job became find me diet pills so I'm not passed out by the second half of the evening. And the but poor woman was just so free. She finally, she finally was searched diligently, couldn't find anybody to replace me for a while, then finally did. I was out of there. I made her life miserable. Uh, and I don't even know what's wrong with me. I don't know that I have this physiological reaction to alcohol. But it ruled me. Isn't it odd that a guy like me can be driven by something and never see it? And one of the reasons I couldn't see it is that it uses my own mind against me. And I don't know that it's doing that. In all my powers of rush, rationalization and justification, and it uses it against me. There's a test in the big book that it, it says if you don't think you're an alcoholic, try this test, try to go over the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking, try to drink and stop abruptly. Well, I don't think I would learn anything from that because of the way my mind works. If I go into a bar to do that and I'm going to go in there, okay, I'm going to see if these AA people are full of crap or not. I'm going to have two drinks, that's it, shut her down, go home. Now you can't smoke nothing, take nothing, 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 two drinks, that's it. Well, halfway through the second drink, it's going to become very apparent to me that this is a bad test day. <laughs> because the game would be on. That game, I didn't know that game was on. I can't leave now, for God's sakes. Or there'd be some, remember, the, some girl in the bar, I'd look at her and go, oh, she can be her. Can't leave now, gotta have a drink with her. Or some Joe or some friend of mine would come in, always have something good going on. I can't leave, I gotta have a drink. Tomorrow would be a better test day. And tomorrow, if I tried the same test again, I am absolutely sure it happened. Halfway through that second drink, as the effect of the alcohol starts to hit me, it's like a key turns in my head and everything in me gets behind whatever is necessary to make me think that the one more drink is my idea and absolutely appropriate. And I didn't know that I was being pumped out by an allergic reaction to alcohol. Why every time I started to drink, I would just burn my life to the ground every single time. I, I, I heard this years ago, it's really true. That for an alcoholic of my type to pick up a drink, it's like having sex with a gorilla. You ain't done till the gorilla's done. You can, you can tell yourself all, all, all you want, me and the gorilla are just gonna have a dance. No, you're not, no. It's gonna be bad before it's over. Uh, but I don't know that. I, I started hitting in the, 
in the years that I was more trying to be chemically balanced, I started going to treatment centers, and they, they'd ask me a weird question. They'd say, what's your drug of choice? <sighs> well, what do you got? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I drank vanilla extract. In, in jail one time, I broke open a magic marker and huffed it, just hoping something might happen. You know, I, I mean, drug of choice. What they should have asked me is, what happens to you when you ingest alcohol into your system? What happens to you when you start to feel the effect of the alcohol? Do you break out in an irresistible yearning for more of that effect? And that, Dr. Silkworth says, defines us. It is what makes me an alcoholic. That and what makes me a chronic alcoholic. Because there's alcoholics, I believe, I've, I've seen some, that their alcoholism ends at that point. And those are the people that our book talks about on the bottom of page 20. Those are the guys like that I've seen that I grew up with that used to get in a lot of trouble from drinking. And they come to their senses one day and realize that, you know, they can't, they can't drink. They can't even take the first one because it, it, it always, they always go too far. So they make up their mind and mean it that they're never going to drink again, and they don't. And they live normal, productive lives. Now, I have gotten to the point where I was every bit as serious about not drinking as they were. I've gotten to the point time and time and time again where I've sworn to myself with everything in me and meant it. That my God, I'm never going to touch that stuff again. I can't go on like this. There's guys I went to high school with that are buying houses. And I'm sleeping on somebody's couch, and I'm smarter than them. <laughs> and my life is, a, is pathetic. And I would swear to myself. But there's something about chronic alcoholism that's insidious. That I don't know what's wrong with me. It doesn't make any sense to me. Because I, had, I seem to have such an amazing willpower in some areas. I mean, when I make up my mind about something, I... You couldn't stop me, pretty much. I, I used to do. I used to live a lifestyle for uh, that was insane. I, I used to work at this in, in this factory that was a hellhole. I mean, it was horrible, and I put up with it because I needed the money to drink. And I get off, and I get out of that place, and there was a bar. It was like midnight. There was a bar across the street that that, that closed like you had to by law at two o'clock. But if you were already in there, they'd let you stay until five a.m. Right? Uh, or said sometimes even later. And I would sometimes I would go in there and I would drink until five a.m. And then I would I would come out of there and I'd have to go to court or I'd have to go do something in the morning. When I got on, the, even when I was on the uh, the uh, day shift, when I got rotated back to the day shift, I would drink in there until 5 a.m. and then be at work at 7. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I'm still drunk. And I'd go to work, I'd drink a whole bunch of coffee and go to work. And I'd do that time and time and time again. I, I mean... Some of us live a life of where throwing up is just part of the deal. You know, you throw up and it kind of gives you a new start for a little bit. You know, it's not a bad deal. And, and what we do, the willpower that it takes to feed the beast is amazing. So I couldn't understand why it is after three or four treatment centers, after you finally, you finally get it, you've been bludgeoned into an acceptance of, of that I can't take the first drink, and I know that, and I've sworn to myself and mean it, and seven or eight months later, I'm back at it again. Now, if you did that once or twice, you're a knucklehead. You do that 10 or 11 times, there's something wrong with you. And I did it over and over and over again. The last couple years, it was so... It was so horrendous that I stopped getting back up again. You know, I, I, I was the guy that was, I, I was accepted to Ivy League colleges. I was the guy that would have been valedictorian of my senior class if I hadn't been arrested the week before graduation. I, I was the guy who had all the potential. I was the smart guy. And I can't, I can't stay sober. And I don't know why. 
I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and the last couple years, um, I'd get physically sober again, and I'm not the guy that's out beating the bushes to get the good job and the girlfriend and the nice place to live in, in a Harley and getting a nice guitar and all. I'm not that guy anymore. Because you start to know the truth. You start to get it. Like, what's the point? Because I know it's going to happen. Why should I work like hell to try to build this up when every single time, no matter how much I tell myself I'm not going to burn my life to the ground, every single time I do. And, and there, there's an aspect of my powerlessness that is hideous. And it's that I don't have the power to resist the first drink. I mean, I can for a while, but if you're an alcoholic of my type, the question is not if you're going to drink again. If you've got untreated alcoholism, the question is when. It is, it is a dead certain inevitability with a guy like me. And there, even there are some cases where extreme willpower is used and we don't return to drinking. And then in three years sober, guys like me blow our brains out because where are you going to go? Where are you going to go if, if, if you're not drinking and you can't drink and yet you're suffering from alcoholism? Because if you're an alcoholic and you take away the alcohol, what are you left with except the ick? You know, and the ick eats my lunch. And I am everything that talks about in that book, restless, irritable, discontent. I'm everything on page 52. I don't know why, but I am. And I, I, I suffer from deep depressions when sometimes when I'm sober. I, I've been diagnosed as clinically depressed and given the treatment for that. And I, I know, like I know I'm standing here, that it was a misdiagnosis. And I'll tell you why that is evident. Because the treatment for clinical depression the best it did was give me a little bit of relief and put me on a, a holding pattern that eventually wasn't enough and I had to go back to drinking. It wasn't until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and started this treatment for alcoholism that I started to be relieved of the bondage of self, which was really where the depression came in. It was the, it was the depression of a guy who when he quits drinking just gets his, his emotions his future and it's bleak looking. I've never, I've never looked at my future where it looked good. And it's bleak looking in my past and all the guilt. I get my very life just kind of on me. Like in that creature in that movie Alien that attaches itself to your face. And what happens is after a while it, felt, it feels like somebody stepped on the oxygen hose to my being here. After a while I feel like I'm smothering here. After a while, I just, I, I don't, it's not that I yearn to get drunk. I yearn for freedom. I just want to bust out. I just can't, I just can't take this because all the emotions and, and the, and the God-awful loneliness. And alcoholism is a lonely business of being locked up in me. It just wears on me day in and day out and week in and week out until I eventually, I can't see anything except the possibility of ease and comfort, the possibility of freedom. And Sukhra says something very interesting in our book. He, when he talks about after a time, we can't differentiate the true from the false. The, the reality of the last couple of years of my drinking is that there was no ease and comfort and freedom in the bottle anymore. Uh, there had not been for probably the last three years of, the last two for sure, I drank and I felt sorry for myself. I went on crying jags. It was pathetic. I sank into deep depressions. If I was sleeping on your couch at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'd call my parents up and cry into the phone about you didn't raise me right. You know, oh, just pathetic stuff. I'd call ex-girlfriends at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, which they're just delighted to hear from me drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my sister, and it was, it, this is not a party, this is pathetic. It's horrible. I don't bathe anymore. I loathe myself. I can't even get, I can't even, even submerge the, the feelings anymore with alcohol. All, all I can get is oblivion. 
And I drank, the last couple of years, I just drank the blot Bob out. My whole life kind of reduced to the most amount of blot Bob out for the least amount of money. But I drank a lot of Richard's Wild Irish Rose because it... When you do the math, it would come in Thunderbird would come out on top a lot. So occasionally I'd find a sale on a cheap vodka, but most of the time it was wine. As far as the most proof alcohol for the least amount of money. Because that's all that mattered to me at the end. And here's here's how alcoholism punks me out. You get that's my reality. That's the truth. Yet you get me sober for six months with restless, irritable discontent. Six months of untreated, the untreated spiritual malady of alcoholism. And I will start to fantasize that I can party like I partied when I was 18 and 20 years old again. In spite of an of a unacceptable reality that that has been a dead horse now for years. But my God, I don't want it to be a dead horse. So desperately that I convince myself that there's a party where there is no party. And you know, if you're like me, you don't know that until you start drinking and feeling sorry for yourself. And then the bottom falls out and you say, it's really awful. And that was the last couple years of my drinking. And I, uh, I, I was in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I was in and out, I was in 11 uh, places of recuperation, or what refers to it in our book. Uh, I never thought of them as that at the time, but I was in 11 of those places. Uh, I got sober over and over and over again, and relapsed over and over and over and over again. And, um, I, I, I didn't think, I, I, I came, there was a period when I first started coming around Alcoholics Anonymous when I was about 20, I just had a tremendous disdain for you. You were really... You were, I don't know what you were, but you were weird. You were not, at first you were very, very old. I mean, very, very old. And, and you, were, you were glad to see me, which I don't know what that, listen, I'm not gay, so back off, buddy. You know, I don't know what that's about. I don't know what, the guys want to hug me and stuff. It was just, I don't know what that's about. Uh, and, and, and you were enthusiastic, and, and you laughed at things that didn't make sense to me. You were like some kind of cross between Amway and the Salvation Army. <laughs> you know, like, so it was very, very weird. You're very weird. And, and if you're new, if you're sitting here and you're new, AA is a strange place. I mean, it really is. It, it, it's the only place I've ever been to because of our second tradition where you come in a big shot and work your way up to servant. I mean, everywhere else it's the other way around. You come in a servant. You come in and sweep the floor. Hopefully you're a boss one day. Alcoholics and I just AA is the only place you'll ever find where the, the more the sicker and more decrepit you are, the more we like you. Matter of fact, you'll see old timers fight over the real sick newcomers. You know, they're always I want it. It's, my, you know, it's, a, it's the only AA is so different from any other place. It, like churches, a lot of churches. If you're, I, I used to go to churches sometimes. I'd go just about anywhere when I was desperate. And I go to a church, and if you join a church, and you're a sinner, they want you to join the church. But they, after you're there for a while, they kind of they kind of expect you to stop sinning. I mean, it's implied in the brochure. I, I mean, really. Not, not alcoholics and alcoholics, we're not like that at all. We can all sin as long as you can stand it. Matter of fact, we'll sit in coffee shops and go, do you know what so-and-so is doing? Yeah, he lives. He'll help a lot of people with that. <laughs> Um, I watched the sobriety countdowns. I, I watched the, the, the newest guy in the room, the guy that's the most raw, the guy that loathes himself the most, the guy that's the most depressed and hopeless, and we give him a gift for being, for burning his life to the ground. I mean, that's nuts. Uh, I mean, uh, it kind of makes you want to not do it again. So, and more, more than any of that, I would sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous in the latter years, and I would sit there at times, and my God, I, gotta, I can't go on like this, and I really need help, and I would listen to you, I started listening to you, and I started watching you, 
and in very short order, I became convinced that whatever's wrong with me, it's not really the same thing that's wrong with you. Because I listen to you and I watch you now that you're sober. And my God, you're wonderful. I mean, you're a little wacky, but you're great. I mean, you, you're, you laugh a lot. Everything's funny. There's nothing funny in my world. I mean, you, God, you, you're grateful for everything. Oh, I don't even like anything. I don't like me. I, I mean, you, oh, you love everybody. I love everybody. I love everybody. Jeez. Oh. And I, I came to a conclusion based on knowing about me and how I get when I stop drinking. I feel like I'm doing time and I'm depressed and lonely. I've got a mind that when I stop drinking just gets on me and will not leave me alone. I mean, my God, I just, it's, it, it wears me out. That's why a lot of times newcomers that haven't done anything in A except go to meetings and not drink, by the end of the day, they look worn out because it's like you're, you're trapped in a very small space with a bunch of ADD kids that have overdosed on sugar and none of them like you. It's just, it's just all the time. And by the end of the day, I'm just like worn out. I, I get terminal illnesses. Like every third or fourth day, I imagine that I'm dying of something. I, I don't get headaches, I get brain tumors. I mean, I can't, I, 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 I can't tell you how, I, this, it's so pathetic. I can't tell you how many just heartfelt deathbed speeches I've rehearsed in my head. I mean, I've had every disease you can think of. Isn't it, I'll tell you something funny. Hypochondriacs imagine that they have every single disease on the planet except alcoholism. They never imagine that they have alcohol. Not anything else. I mean, Steve was talking about rickets and while it was still on the table. I could see rickets, but I couldn't. When I, you don't know, think alcoholism. I remember I was convinced at one time I ended up, oh God, ended up in this hospital. Because I, I hurt myself sometimes when I'm drunk. And I ended up in this hospital. They were stitching me up and they had to x-ray me. And, and I, I kind of sobered up. I was in there several hours. And I'm sitting in the waiting room. And they got this uh, rack of pamphlets, medical pamphlets. And I grabbed, and I, you know, heart disease and diabetes and all this stuff. And I grabbed one of these pamphlets. And it's a pamphlet on the seven warning signs of cancer. Well, I, I'm now I'm kind of sober. My head's clearing up a little bit. I start reading this pamphlet. And one of the things it talks about is, is continuous, reoccurring, unexplained bleeding. And I'm reading that and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm bleeding out both ends. I mean, I throw up blood sometimes. I thought, oh my God, I've got cancer. Oh, 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 wait, wait, oh. It, it, it's like such a revelation. It's metastasized to my brain. And that, exp that explains the, the weird things I do and can't remember them. It explains how sometimes I just almost get in these comatose depressions. I got a brain tumor pressing on my brain. Oh my God. It explained my whole life. And I remember I had this fantasy that went on for quite some time about one of these days they're going to discover that I have cancer. They're going to take me to the cancer ward. They're going to notify my parents who had thought that I was a bum. And they're gonna come running over to the hospital, properly ashamed of themselves. Oh my God, Bob, we thought you were a bum. We didn't know you had a brain tumor. And, and they would tell all my ex-girlfriends who thought I was a bum, and they'd come running over to the hospital, properly ashamed of themselves. And if they were really ashamed, I might forgive some of them. I'm not sure, I don't know. It's on their level of sincerity. And, and I ended up in a, in a treatment center. <laughs> I said, I told this doctor, I said, I, I think I have a brain tumor. And they put me through a bunch of tests and I had a bleeding ulcer and a hemorrhoid. Well, that was... I, I, that, that's a, this, is, this is the bizarre part. I remember when they told me that, it's I, I, like I wanted a second opinion. <laughs> like, I, this is the kind of ego I have. My ego doesn't care if I'm gonna die as long as after I'm dead everybody realizes how wrong they were about me and I was right. I mean, I have that kind of ego. And consequently, I can't get nothing here. 
Because I sit in the rooms and the problem is, is I got too much of me between me and you. And I don't know it. See, one of the things that happens to me when I, when I stop drinking is I get right about everything. And there was a great psychiatrist who nailed me when he said he worked with, with hundreds, maybe thousands, thousands of us actually. And he said the reason that a lot of us never get better is that our egos are so distorted and so sick, even though we, we have no self-esteem, that we have an inability to listen to anybody in order to hear anything new. I can only listen to see how I'm already right. And if you're like that, you're a closed system. You're unsponsorable, you're unteachable, you can't even hear anything in a meeting. The only people that you'll listen to is somebody that agrees with you. And if you're new and somebody agrees with you, they're not doing very well either. <laughs> no, I, and that, that's not a put down of people that are new. That's just part of the territory. I mean, you know, when I was brand new, a guy, a guy named Joe cornered Joe right cornered me after a meeting, and he said something was hilarious. And it was, I didn't. It, it should have. A year before, I would, I would have been fight mad. I wasn't. He said to me, he says, kid, you need to take step three. And I told Joe, I said, Joe, I can't take step three. I don't believe in God. He said, you don't have to believe in God. I said, Joe, that's what it says. It says we made a decision. I read it right off the wall, right there. It says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. I said, I don't understand God or even know if there is a God. He said, listen, kid, if you'll turn your will and your life over to this chair, and he points to a chair in the meeting room, he says, I guarantee you a miracle instantly. And I thought, okay. I turned my will and my life over to the chair, and what's the miracle? He said, he got a big smile on his face. He says, oh, the miracle would be your life's no longer in the hands of an idiot. <laughs> I didn't even get mad. I just thought, yeah, that'd be right. Yeah. Because if you would have followed me around and observed me, as people did, or maybe as your loved ones have observed you, objectively, it, you would easily come to the conclusion that whoever's making decisions for this person is out to destroy them. Yet it never looks that way to me. Um, I have this amazing ability to justify myself. You know what the problem with self-justification is? Self. <laughs> It's the root of my problem. As a matter of fact, anything, any word that has self in it is probably not good for me unless it's except for selfless. Uh, Self-justification, self -justification, self -justification. And I, I can't see it. I had a great, there was a guy in, in Vegas who died with uh, cancer with quite a few years of sobriety named Dale. Dale was a gruff old guy, but he was a, I really liked it. He always said something that would really get me at meetings and make me think and look at stuff. And he, he liked me and he came up to me after a meeting and he said to me, he says, listen kid, he has gruff old guy. Says, listen, I'm going to tell you some things that if you abide, it's going to save you a lot of pain and grief. He said, kid, I want you to know if you're explaining something, if you're justifying something, if you're defending something or rationalizing something, kid, I want you to know you're wrong. Because you never have to explain, defend, justify, or rationalize what's right. Joe told me that probably close to 30 years ago. Or, I mean, uh, Dale told me that close to 30 years ago. And I haven't found an exception to that yet. Um, when I am, when, when the separation of alcoholism has been reduced, and I'm cool with you, and I'm cool with God, and I'm cool with me, there's nothing to justify. When, I'm, when I am selfishly self-seeking, there's all kinds of stuff to justify and defend. You know, I, I've been thinking, I was just talking to my friend Sandy before the meeting, and I've been thinking about it. I talked to Michelle about it also sometimes. I talked to quite a bit of people, actually, because it it's a piece of business in my life, and I worry about it. I worry about doing this. And I... There's an inherent... See, I, it, over the years, I've really, really started to get a good view of my enemy here, this thing, this ego, that the book equates to self. When it says self-centered or egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays, I, I, I know how squirmy and devious it is. I know how it's, ins, it's insatiability. 
I know how it, it's, it's a trickster. The, one of the greatest tricks it's ever pulled is to convince me it's not there. And it's devious. And it, I have gone through phases in Alcoholics Anonymous that I can only see in hindsight where, where my ego has taken the traditions, taken the steps, taken my knowledge of the book and used it to grandize. It, it taken my years of sobriety and made a flag to wave it, to grandize myself out of it. It's taken the fact that I, I asked to speak a lot and they put it on the flag. And it's all self, 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 self stuff. I remember I went through this phase where I was, I did it with the traditions, I did it with the big book, I did it with the steps. I went through a, a phase where, man, if I could go to a meeting and catch somebody with a traditions violation, it was freaking Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man, I couldn't, oh, I just loved it. Oh, you know what? Pump, there's, a, there's, a, there's this expression in Texas, they call puffing up. You know, I puff up. I couldn't wait. And, and, and my, my ego even took my knowledge of the book and the steps and used it. Where I wouldn't go, I wouldn't approach people to help them. I'd approach them to show them how they weren't right about their program and I was. Right? Now that's pathetic. But I went through a phase like that. And, and I have a tremendous uh, fear, I guess, and respect for this ego. And I also have a tremendous love and, and, and appreciation and gratitude for God's grace. And I, sometimes I, sometimes I feel like I'm in between the two, um, stuck. Sometimes I'm, I'm really on the God, grace of God side, and other times I just I, I kind of have this natural default position of slipping back into self. And, and it's, I don't even have to do anything. It's almost like it has a bungee cord on it, just it left unattended. I automatically just kind of go back into me again. You know, I, I've had to kind of, it's just a, and, and the reason this scares me, this has the potential to feed something in me that should be starved. Um, and I, I worry about it a lot. And I, I have a couple people in my life, my sponsor, and I say, and a couple people I've, I've asked them, if, if I look like I'm getting weird doing this, please save my life and tell me about it. I've watched a lot of people go south on this. I, I don't, I, I've caught myself at little times developing like a persona around this. And that's a very, that's a very, the, our book says that, that we lose ourselves in the beginning of chapter into action by living the double life. I don't want to have this, a stage character. I, I want to. I, my 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 existence and my recovery and my staying here depends upon uh, a, a program of rigorous honesty, a genuineness that that I uh, uh, that is ultimately free. When I can be genuine, I can be. I'm free. It's it's the double life that keeps me a hostage, the, probably more than anything. And I and I, and I get where I worry about. That. I don't know how I got off of that. In 19... In 1977, uh, I was sentenced to two years in a state penitentiary by a very kind judge who, who, who sent me and then stayed the commitment and said, we're not going to carry this out. We're going to put you in a place called the Ark House. And it wasn't really much of a treatment center. It was like the bottom of the food chain for treatment. The reason they were putting me in there is because I'd been in St. John's and St. Francis and Gateway and Amicus House, and none of those places would take me anymore. And it was the bottom of the food chain, and it was run by a guy uh, named Chuck who uh, worked with down and out guys and guys out of prison. They had about 200 people there, bunk beds as far as you can see. And, and I went to live in this old abandoned bank building that they converted into this rehab on East Ohio Street in Pittsburgh. And I went in there and I, it's, I'm, I'm getting out. I, if I could stay in there a year and get good, good year analysis reports and good PO reports and make the restitution, I'm, I'm, I'm a free man. If not, I'm doing two years. And I, I went in there with a sincerity about staying sober. But when it says in our book, lack of power is our dilemma, when it, that's me. When it says in there, there comes a time when you have no 
no human defense, when there's no mental defense, there's no defense against the first dream, that I can't, self-knowledge doesn't help, determination doesn't help, willpower doesn't help, nothing helps, that eventually I go back to drinking, and I did, and I came, and it was hideous, it was, I, I went back to drinking so desperately seeking some ease and comfort, some relief, some freedom from this awful loneliness that had been on me now for a couple months, and, and I don't, and I get, I'm worse now that I'm drinking, I'm depressed, and I, I come to in this park, and this doctor in, in a place called Gateway, and after examining me and told me, it was about a year before or so, he, he said, I was in my 20s, and he said, you're, you're a young enough kid and healthy enough that you could go on like you're going on for another five years or more before it actually kills you. And I came to in the park that day, and I remember thinking about five more years of this, and I thought to myself, I, I, I ain't doing five more days of this. And I made up my mind, uh, and I wasn't doing it for attention or pity or anything, I made up my mind to kill myself. And I just wanted out, I just wanted to make this stop. I was in a trap, I couldn't spring, drinking was awful, and not drinking was awful. And suicide could start looking like a good deal to a guy like me under those conditions. Because I don't see, I don't see another door, I don't see door number three. And, and, and I'm, I'm not alone in this, because for, for a couple reasons. One is, I don't think it's alcoholism. I don't know what it is because I've been to the psychiatrist and they don't seem to know what it is either. They, they, they all, everyone I see thinks he knows, but they don't really know. And, and I don't think AA works for, will work for a guy like me because I've been to, I've probably been to 150, 200 meetings by this time. And I don't think it's, I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous would work for me. But my God, I am so not alone at that. I've talked to, whew, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of alcoholics. I go to a detox, I talk to guys down there all, every week, and I've never met anybody yet that came to AA at that place in, in the hopelessness and despair and loneliness and depression of, of alcoholism who looked at the 12 steps and went, oh yeah, that would work. <laughs> Nobody says that. Nobody, it, it doesn't, they don't, the thing about the, about AA is it doesn't look like it'll work till after you do it. Then we all say the same thing. We say, oh, I should have done that years ago. <laughs> but it's, it doesn't look like it'll work until you do it. And, and, and AA doesn't, isn't, it doesn't work like five shots of tequila. AA works like, with, like that creeper pot that they had back in the 70s. Do you remember the creeper pot? You'd smoke that stuff and you'd think, man, I got beat. This ain't no good. And then about... 30 minutes later, you can't even stand up. It's like, you know, it's like you creep up on you. And you do all this stuff, and they go, ah, this is bad. This ain't even doing nothing. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a situation that you absolutely know would have gotten you drunk the year before. And not only do you stay sober and through it, you learn something. And you start getting these, these glimpses that something's happening here. Something is happening here. And Alcoholics Anonymous uh, started to change me. Uh, when I was, I had this major surrender and I started buying all this, these actions and doing all this stuff when I was new. And then something very hideous happened to me. Harry Tebow talks about the amazing recuperative powers of the alcoholic ego. It grew back. And it, it came back, it learned, it came back clever and it came back smarter, and it came back more insidious, and I don't even know it, but I'm starting to battle with depression again, uh, all this other stuff, because it had grown back. And in a little over four years sober, I went back and I went through the steps again, and this time, uh, meticulously followed the process in the big book. And it, it changed me. Not once and for all, because there's you know, chronic illnesses and like that, but it, it, it got me on a, a different, got me in a different direction. You know, one of the things that had happened is as my ego grew back, I was the guy who knew everything again. I was the guy you couldn't tell nothing to. I was the guy that would go to meetings and, and just know what's wrong with everybody. I was the guy that judged everybody in AA. I was the gossip guy. I, it wasn't really gossip. I was 
giving you information you needed to know about these people. <laughs> In case you ever wanted to help them. And I, I become that guy, you know, and I was, I, was in bad, I was in a bad spot, and I went through that fourth step, and I listed all my resentments, which are really, in effect, all my judgments. All the, thing, all the things I know I'm right about. And I had a lot of them in AA, a lot of them. And some from my past, because I had never done this, this process this way before. And then when I got to This Was Our Course, the book asked me to do something, to look at this from an entirely different angle, to, to put myself in their shoes, and to look at it through their eyes, and to see how these people who had harmed me were perhaps just like me, spiritually sick. That I, I had to realize, I had to see myself in them. Uh, and this is not like a, a well person looking down on a sick person. This is a sick person looking right across the table at a guy that's exactly like him. One of the best demonstrations of that I've ever seen was in the movie Bucket List. There was a scene in there where these two guys, Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson, are suffering from an, a horrendous regimen of, of chemotherapy and it's brutal. And they're, they're not given the chemotherapy on the same day and they're not sick on the same day and they're not sick exactly the same way. The symptoms of the chemo varies a little bit from day to day and from person to person. But there's this one scene where the one guy is just, he's just a mess and he's, he's irritable and he's just, he's the kind of, don't even want to leave. But the other guy's not looking at him like he's irritated, he's looking at him with love and compassion because he sees himself in the guy. He gets it. He sees through the behavior to what's really going on. It's the veil is lifted and he's, a, he's awake and he gets it. And he has compassion from the Latin com meaning with and passio pain is that I, I can sit with your pain. And I started to look at everybody in my life that I judged like that. My God, uh, if you ask me after that, fifth step, what were the exact nature of my wrongs where I would have told you how wrong I'd been about my mother, father, and sister, and the women in my life, and the bosses. I can't imagine a greater ego-reducing proposition than to list every judge, everything you know you're right about, every person you secretly suspect owes you an amends, and then to see and really get it in here, connect the dots, really get how wrong you've been about every case. I can't imagine a greater ego-reducing proposition. And if you're new here, or not so new, maybe you're entrenched in yourself 20 years sober, and you can't stand to be wrong, you're going to have a hard time in sobriety. Because a lot of what, what I, I have to do and redo and redo in order to keep God active in my life is to see, is to move me out, is to move me out of the way. See, I, the problem, it's recurring, is I always get, once again, too much of me between me and you, and too much of me between me and God. And I can measure my distance from God by measuring my distance from you. I can measure my distance from my own decision in step three by the amount of opinions and judgments in my life. On a good spiritual hair day, I look around me and it's all good. No, no offense, Wayne. And it's all good. Uh, on a bad spiritual hair day, I see what's wrong with you. Because I've climbed up on the, unbeknownst to me under the throne of judgment again. And I keep trying to reduce self and turn my consciousness towards God. And I, uh, over the years, I've come to, I've just in the last probably eight or nine years, I think, I've really started to trust Him. Um, I think I was afraid of Him for a while. Um, I don't know. I, I, when things would happen, it was I would all the fear would rush back, and now when things happen, I get a little anxious and I and I worry. But underneath all of that is I know something. I know that, that God loves me, and no matter what, He will take care of me. He's always there for me. There's a, a principle that I think some of us build our lives on, and the principle is that the power behind us will always be greater than the seemingly seeming obstacles before me. And that, that I am wrong. And the knowledge of knowing I'm wrong when something appears on the radar that looks like, oh, this is going to be awful. 
I got, I got 500 instances in my life where I've been wrong about that. Where I can go, well, maybe not. I don't have to go crazy because maybe this is just like the other 499 times that I thought it was the end of the world and ran around like a chicken going, the sky is falling and maybe it's not really falling. And the knowledge that I, my perception is wrong sometimes saves me from me. And I, I, know, I know that God's there for me. I, uh, if you're new, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I, I don't know if you've identified with anything I've shared tonight. I, I don't know. If, uh, if you haven't, there'll be another speaker this weekend that you'll connect with. we got a wrench for every nut in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And if you do identify with me, God help you. <laughs> you need AA very, very badly. Thank you for my life.